Steve! How's it going, man? Hey, Jeremy, what's going on? You know, I'm just here picking up the new garden gloves that just dropped today, so I had to be first in line for these, obviously, but what are you working on? Some kind of home improvement? No way, man. I'm building my own do-it-yourself artificial pancreas. I'm sick of waiting for it. Well, Steve, you're an endocrinologist. You know what a DIY pancreas is, right? Listen, Jeremy, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I got it all figured out. Really strong tubing so there's no kinking. I got a plunger in case there's any clogging and a crowbar. It's made of metal, improves the signal, no dropping out. Think about it, man. Excuse me. You might be onto something. Oh, Steve, check it out. Gorilla Glue. Awesome. This thing's never going to fall off. Hey, what are you going to do with the beer? Oh, that's just for me for later. But, you know, not that we need to, but maybe we should check out this next session on a DIY artificial pancreas system. Sounds good. Let's show them ours. Totally. <laughs> Hello everyone, Steve Edelman here. Most of you know me, but I work at TCOID. I'm also at University of California, San Diego. I'm here with my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Earl Hirsch. Both of us have had type one diabetes for a long time. Dr. Hirsch is a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And so today we're gonna take you through the four hybrid closed loop systems that are currently available and do a little differentiation and mainly make a impression on you on how they have changed the way we treat people with type 1 diabetes and for a small subset of you folks with type 2 who need insulin. So the first slide really is a picture of what it's like to have diabetes uh, you know in the olden days and it's unpredictable swings in blood sugars throughout the day. This is an old CGM download, Earl, before hybrid closed loop, probably when CGM was first coming out. If you remember the download, each, each color was a different day. And this is what people realized what was happening all the time. They just never knew it because they were pricking their finger four to five times a day. And as if, a doctor, what do you do with that? Yeah. What do you, well, you know what? It is kind of an abstract art type of thing. And this is one of my favorite slides uh, that, uh, and I used to show this all the time, and I still do, depending on who I'm speaking to. But, you know, really the best way to treat type 1 is to stand perfectly still, do not exercise, do not eat. And if your basal rate is set somewhat close, you'll be fine. But, I mean, like us right now. Like us right now. Okay. Yeah, but not like us at breakfast a few minutes ago. And... So first, what's gonna to happen today is we're gonna talk a little bit about what a hybrid loop, closed loop system is. For some of you not familiar with the jargon that we're gonna talk about, listen to this lecture again later. It's also gonna be in our video vault. Um, and then we're gonna go through the four systems. So really the most important bullet of all the bullets I'm gonna show you today is that now there's communication between the insulin pump and the continuous glucose monitor. Uh, otherwise, we could not have a hybrid closed loop system. And basically these systems, and we're gonna repeat some of this information, they will give you a little bit more in insulin automatically based on your blood sugar as it's going up, and it will automatically decrease and eventually stop your insulin altogether on the way down, and if it predicts you're gonna hit your lower alert level, and every system we talk about is just a little bit different. I think you have a good picture of the car uh, to describe that. And the basal rate modulates up and down automatically 24 seven, every five minutes if needed, based on the continuous glucose monitor. So when we talk about, you know, what's your basal rate set at in the older pump systems that do not communicate, that is out the window. Now it happens all the time. Um, and automatic insulin uh, delivery uh, is really based on many factors. And this is important. And it shows you how sophisticated what we call the algorithm. Every hybrid closed loop has its own algorithm. So it's the predicted glucose up to 30 to 60 minutes ahead of time. 
your insulin to carb ratio, your insulin sensitivity factor, the duration of insulin action, and how many carbs do you have on board, anticipated exercise and sleep. So you can imagine that these systems are actually fairly sophisticated. And of course, there are different settings on each system, whether you're exercising or sleeping or doing both at the same time. And you know what's really interesting about this, Steve, is that it's safe. I mean, we don't hear about problems of the pump misbehaving, causing any safety issues. The only safety issues we really see is human error, where patients put in more food than they're eating intentionally to get more insulin. Um, occasionally, we still have issues with uh, insulin occlusions and you know the catheter falling out and that type of thing. But for the most part, these are extremely safe. And one of the reasons for that is not just that the pumps are so good, but the CGM is so good. And we didn't have that a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, that, that is so true. I mean, we were just talking about it before we started taping this lecture that we haven't heard of any negative safety issues with these devices other than human error. Now, the last bullet point is that you still have to enter your carbs when you eat. Not that that's horrible, but this is what makes it a hybrid closed loop versus a totally closed loop system, which is basically... Uh, you do anything you want at any time with no settings to, uh, to put in. So we're, we're getting there, and, we, and you're going to talk about the absorption of insulin, which is a big issue. But these systems, and I think you would agree, change the way we treat uh, oh, people with diabetes. Completely. And I, and I will also tell you, here's the slide of the hybrid closed loop systems we're going to talk about. But there's another one that's being tested called the uh, beta bionic uh, islet. Islet is the name of the pump. And you don't even have to put your carbs in. You just put, you're going to eat, you press a button, and you're done. So even that is getting simpler as time goes on. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. So Earl, why don't you take it from here a little bit? Okay, so we're going to talk about these four different available pumps. And I say available because technically, Steve, they are not, quote unquote, on the market. Because what we're talking about um, in these pumps are the Medtronic 670G and 770G. They are on the market right now in early 2022. The Tandem Control IQ, the DIY, you will also see open source looping with an old Medtronic pump or Omnipod pump. Now, these are not technically FDA approved, um, but a lot of people are using them. And the Omnipod 5, which will be on the market later this year, um, that was approved by the FDA in early 2022, and a lot of people are excited about that one. Yeah, you know, Earl, the FDA does know about the do-it-yourself looping system, and they seem to tolerate it fine. And apparently, and, and you're, you're in the mix with all the studies, there is a formal study going on now, and I think the data is all in. And, and um, yeah, we can talk about that if we have time. Great. I'd like to do that. So... Why do we need hybrid closed loop? And this is just an example with the tandem control IQ. I want to show you something. First of all, this is a tandem control IQ on the 21st and 22nd of 2020. But what I want you to pay attention to is the fact that the green, you can see in both of these on the left, you're in range but the insulin modulation is different for these two consecutive days. When the insulin is going strong, when it's going down, when it's turning off, it's different. The point isn't how much insulin you're getting. The point is the time is in range both nights, but the bigger point is the pump is modulating to keep you or to keep this individual in target. And when you have the same basal rate night after night, that's not possible. You also see this here giving more insulin and giving less insulin, two consecutive nights in the same patient. You see the same thing here um, with this patient where you're, some nights you're giving more insulin, whereas on the next night you're actually stopping the insulin when the night before you're giving more insulin. Yeah, and I've always made this point that every day is different for someone with type 1 diabetes and that, you know, one night may look completely different than the next night when you look at how much insulin is needed. And these modulating basal rates are 
incredible. And I think I make a point later on that these systems really work well overnight because someone's sleeping typically. They're not eating, they're not messing up with their carb counting, things like that. Uh, but there are many commonalities in this system, and I think you're going to get to a, a little bit later that they all are a little bit different under the hood. Uh, that, that's true, but I think the important thing here is the fact that we now have a better understanding why this happens. Why is it not just overnight, like in this example, but why is it that you do the same exercise, you do the same food, you do the same insulin, and things are different from day to day? And there are many reasons for this. For example, the insulin absorption is different, not just from site to site, which is true, but we've known now for about a decade, the longer that infusion site is in, the faster the absorption. We also know of other things going on under the skin with the way the insulin is broken down to be absorbed. We still have antibodies in some people and not in others. And let's not forget that we are counting carbs but we are also eating protein and fat. And if you don't bolus for the protein and fat, at least yeah. give some insulin, you're gonna have a spike, not to mention what happens with gastroparesis and exercise. I mean, yeah. there are all these things, which is why it is so frustrating for so many people. Yeah, yeah. I so, mean, so this is why we need AID devices, Steve, because between the variability of insulin absorption and challenges with how we replace insulin for food, it is difficult if not impossible to have basal rates, and it doesn't matter if you're on a pump or on multiple injections, or an insulin to carb ratio that is consistent from day to day, because there are too many things that we can't control. We know it's not even consistent from morning till night. That's right, that's right. And automated insulin delivery allows varying basal delivery and automated microboluses for the multiple imperfections in our therapies. And we've all, you and I, between the two of us, Gosh, Steve, we're well over a century. Yeah, yeah, let's, and, not, let's, let's not bring that up anymore. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. So the problem for providers and patients is they're all different under the hood. Each one of these systems that we're talking about work differently. They all work on, they're, they're different under the hood as far as what the algorithms do, but also, and this is a concern of mine, is that for clinicians who don't do the studies like, like we do, in some you have to change the insulin action time, in some you have to change the carb ratio, in some you have to change the basal rates. Well, they're all different and each one is different. So it's gonna be complicated for many providers. And let's not forget, and this may be the most important point, it is estimated, he, at least here in the United States, 50% of adults with type one diabetes are being seen in a primary care clinic where that physician is probably seeing 25 or 30 patients a day. It's very, very difficult. Yeah, I mean, all respect, with due respect to the primary care doctors out there, they really know nothing about these systems, absolutely nothing. And I would say a lot of endocrinologists that, that are not that interested in diabetes, they do thyroid and other areas, they don't really know that much either. And when the residents and medical students come through the clinic just like yours, they just, their eyes open, they go, whoa. They just yeah. can't believe this is happening. Now, I have a Tesla, so there's nothing under the hood. But the bottom line is, you know, we talk about algorithm, algorithm, algorithm. Algorithm to me is a software program that takes all these variables and puts it through a program and tells the pump what to do with the insulin. Is that about right? That's it. Okay. That's yeah. it. That and it's, they're all proprietary. If Tandem, for example, told us the algorithm, they'd have to kill us. But um, so I don't that can really, be arranged. <laughs> I don't want to know the details, but no, no, your, your your point is well good. So let's talk about at least these first two: the Medtronic and the Tandem. The Medtronic, the basils are completely automated, so there's nothing to do with changing the basil. You have to have basils set in case you go on to manual mode for whatever reason. But um, when it's in auto mode the pump is doing all the basils automatically. Isn't that true with all systems? All it's the not true with all systems. It's not, okay. It's not true. All right, I'm it's, gonna learn something. Yes, the only settings the patient and provider can change are the insulin to carb ratio and the insulin action time on that pump. Now, control IQ is different because the basal modulation is dependent on the basils that you have set in the pump. So here the basils do make a difference. Auto bolus, 
given for hyperglycemia. Now that's not in the current Medtronic pump, but it will give you autoboluses to bring the blood sugar down into the target range quicker. But it does it conservatively, but it does it very well. The patient provider can set up the insulin to carb ratio, the sensitivity factor, and the basal doses, which are all used in the algorithm, but not the insulin action time. That's set at five hours in Control IQ, whereas in Medtronic, we're always playing with that insulin action time, and all it does in Medtronic is it gives you a more aggressive correction dose. And these are all these little tidbits that yeah. if you see enough of these patients as a provider, you know what to tweak. So when you say insulin action time, um, that's the same as insulin on board. Same thing. Yeah. And so with looping, which we'll get to, you could set it for the duration of time. Um, and that, like you said, it makes a difference on how the algorithm works. And these microboluses with tandem, you are, you're right. It can occur every hour. It's very conservative. They take 60% of what that's the right. calculation is. Then they subtract any insulin on board as well. So they don't want to over bullish you, but it's, and I think you have a download showing that. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll just say, when you're on tandem control IQ and you are on sleep mode, which has a more aggressive target of 112, it doesn't do the auto boluses just right. to be safe. Glucose targets can indirectly be changed by usual mode, exercise mode, and in control IQ, as I said, sleep mode. That is how you change the targets. It doesn't change the algorithm per se. It's, the way you change this is by changing the targets in all of these. You know, Earl, the, uh, a, a quick word on the two systems. Now, the Medtronic really gets credit for coming out with the first hybrid closed loop years, five years ago or something like that. Um, but uh, I would say this, that uh, the one issue that many patients complain about is it's hard to keep it in auto mode, that they have to do sometimes four, five, six calibrations a day. Some of them get a secondary CGM. They use that data to calibrate. And, and, and so, like I said, they're not putting down the system, but they are getting better. And I believe that the newer systems, like for example, looping, you're always in auto mode. Right. Uh, no, no. And, and hopefully for Medtronic, their um, 780G is available in Europe. Hopefully it will be available here sometime in 2022. And, and I say that because, you know, most of my patients who are on other systems, they don't do any finger sticks anymore. There's well, no need to. I don't. Yeah, there, there's no need to. So I just want to show you, um, this is a, a, typical tandem control IQ patient. Um, the A1C was seven. Um, the average is 153, doing pretty well. You can see the time and range is 71. The target is to be, a below, to be above 70. That's good. Time below range, we want it less than four, 1%. But I want you to look at this. The auto boluses, which we were just talking about, Steve, 11%. Now, I want that number under five. So I know when I'm going to look at this patient, there's a problem. 67% is basal insulin. I know there's a problem here. Yeah. And I need to, but the patient's Ex doing well. Explain that. Why is 67% So, so what we used to teach is it should be about 50-50. And now with these hybrid closed loops, most patients we have found need less than, um, they need less than 50% as basal. And when I see something up approaching 70, I know there's a problem. But if you just look at this person's A1C, or if you look at these, this patient's time and range, you wouldn't know that. And look at this. Only 17% of all the insulin is bolus insulin. And this is the reason why when somebody's actually bolusing and doing well, um, I usually see patients above 80%. That's what I see. And so look at this. Here you see the blood sugar coming down and the insulin being turned off on both nights. And even more impressively, what I see is this patient isn't bolusing. This patient is just letting the pump do its thing. Remember, the patient's doing pretty well, but the patient's putting minimal effort into their diabetes. And What's wrong with that? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that when you have a system like this, yeah. but you can do better. Yeah. There's a bolus on the second day, 1.39. That's like the only bolus. And that's why this patient only has 17% of his total insulin is bolus insulin because he's essentially forgetting he's, 
he has diabetes. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's doing. And we see the same thing here, just giving insulin. And so it's very clear to me, he's getting too much basal insulin with that 67%. And I see that blood sugar coming down every night and the pump stopping every night. We need to reduce that. He needs to take his bolus insulin. And despite these issues, he's actually doing well. Yeah, he just needs to enter carbs when he's eating. He does. And you know what, I'm gonna say something. It doesn't have to be exact because the system is so so forgiving. You just have to enter something. It doesn't have to be exact. I mean, these systems are incredible. This is a 52-year-old man, another really interesting situation. Here, he's in auto mode on the Medtronic 67DG, 67% of the time, not enough. Needs more auto mode, we want it above 80, but the average sensor glucose isn't bad, it's 149. That would be an A1C of around 6.9 or 7% or so. I want you to look, he's taking big doses of insulin. This is an obese guy, 45% bolus insulin. So I know there's a problem when I see 55% basal. And look at this, you see the pink that's flat? That means, there's, that means either he's not getting enough insulin for his boluses or he's missing boluses. And if I make it bigger, what you see is he's missing his boluses but the pump is compensating for that. He's doing okay, but gosh, if he took his boluses, he would do so much better. Yeah, these, these modulating basoroids can only compensate so much. Let's talk about looping. This is the system that I use. They call it do-it-yourself. Uh, as Earl mentioned before, um, it's not FDA approved yet, but they seem to be tolerant of people using it. Um, and you could use an old Medtronic pump that's hackable and the old Omnipod 5 called the Eros at the current time. You also have to have a Riley link because the old Omnipod does not have Bluetooth. This device takes the glucose values and sends it to the app on your phone. And you can see uh, this is the inside of the, uh, the Riley link. I have no clue what that is. And the newest one I love, which is looks like an ear pod called the orange thing. And it's very convenient. And you just put two batteries in last four weeks. Now there's the looping app. You can't go on the, on the Apple store and get it. You have to be a developer and have some time of license. And I also want to point out, I'm a little bit behind in my emails. Please apologize. Oh, you I, caught up compared to the last time I saw you. I apologize Steve. for being behind. <clears throat> this is what the screen looks like. So you have your glucose values in dark dots and predicted glucose in the lighter dash lines. You have the insulin on board. You have your, you have the modulating basal rate right there. You can see it's secreting a lot of insulin. It's, it's that little line you see across is 0.6 units per hour. Then you see it turning off at certain times, all based on the glucose values, uh, two graphs above. And then you have the other one, which is the insulin on board. Now, you can put the Omnipod anywhere you want. Now, I typically use my upper back. That's just, I didn't want to put it in my cerebral I spinal that, I fluid. I don't believe that's you. <laughs> Look at that hair. Are you kidding? Um, it's not you. Now, here's the looping app. You see these little icons along the bottom. I'm gonna go through each one of them. It's pretty impressive. So the first one is for bolusing for meals. The second one is very cool. It's the second from the left. You push it and it lowers your goal range for an up to an hour before eating so that your glucose is drifting down a little bit, but not too much. So when you eat, you don't rebound as high. So it's very kind of a cool advanced feature. Um, this is for giving just a correction bolus, not entering any carbs. Uh, and this is preparing for exercise, very important. And this is for the settings of the pump where you change your insulin to carb ratio, things like that. So this is what the screen looks like when you enter carbs. So on the left, you can see I pushed the taco. It's a little bit shaded there if you can't see it. And it automatically adjusts my insulin uh, absorption time for three hours you, and you type in the carbs that you think and it has a nice little picture you know diary and then on the right you see I clicked on a hamburger and it changed it to four hours so it's very cool um, and you can always adjust each one as time goes on and as the text says you know why it's important but you don't have to be exact with all these systems now this is exercise so this is my actual phone I have my biking uh, where I, you can see on the right, I lowered my insulin delivery by 20%. So it's only 80% of normal. And I set the goal range, you know, 140 to 150. 
Uh, and then I have this mellow exercise, which is I'm either walking or doing something that typically doesn't drive my blood sugar down. All I do is change the target. Now, how far before you exercise yep. do you yep. change that? Yep. Right there, Earl. Okay. One, minimum one hour before. I think you need to do it two hours before. You know what? Two is better. Uh, I, and I try to do... Uh, at least one hour. And, and you, as you know, as well as I, if you haven't eaten or given yourself insulin for a couple hours, it probably doesn't matter. But if you have, you got to start early. And it, that creates problems too, in and of itself, because you may not exercise when you think. Now, I mentioned earlier how well these things work overnight. So there's the CGM download. And you can see overnight, the standard deviation gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Uh, and typically, this is just a tap typical view, no matter what system you're on. And then, of course, when someone starts to eat, uh, that's when all hell breaks loose. And this person's not doing too bad either, uh, right about goal. Now, I wanted to show you that this is uh, someone who was doing extremely well before looping. You know, look at the time and range, above 70%. And look at after. I mean, and, and this person will tell you they're not working any harder. So this is like your patient. They are in what your patient wasn't doing. They're just paying a little bit of attention, entering their carbs, uh, you know, following the rules. These systems are good. And this person's on a low carbohydrate diet. Makes a not, difference. Not zero, but just low. Um, and I want to point out to you folks that uh, there's a website called Loop and Learn. Uh, and, and you can see their motto at the bottom, we are not waiting. And what, what are they waiting? They're not waiting for the FDA. Uh, to approve these things. And the FDA has to be cautious and make sure everything they approve is safe. So Loop and Learn is a great website. So let me finish up with the Omnipod 5. Just got approved, as you mentioned. They're doing a limited release now. And basically, this system uses a Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. And it has an, a new Omnipod with a Bluetooth and a built-in uh, algorithm in the pod itself. And then you have a controller. Now, right now, the controller is just Android. So if you're an iPhone user and you get the Omnipod 5, you got to carry around the two phones. Um, and if, if you activate the Android, you can just talk to yourself. Um, now, the, <laughs> the Omnipod itself has the built-in algorithm. So if your phone's not with you, your basal rate is still doing modulation. If you want a bolus, you got to have the device. And so their system's a little different, but the clinical trials look very good. And I always say clinical trials are one thing, how it reacts in the real world is another, and I predict it's going to be extremely good. So the way these systems work, you know, they give you a little bit more insulin when your blood sugar is going up, they give you a little bit less as you're going down and as you approach your lower limit, in this case uh, 60, it turns off completely. And you can see as the blood sugar is dropping, the insulin pretty much turns off right below it. And then, of course, uh, every system is a little different. You can customize your targets. Some people were complaining about some of the older systems where you couldn't do that. You can do 110 to 150 at 10 milligram increments. Um, and there is a setting for exercise, which is basically, it just sets the goal at 150. That's why I like looping, because I can change that anytime I want. And it also reduces insulin delivery. And this is just sort of a repeat of what I was saying, that the activity feature puts your goal at 150, but if you look at that highlighted second bullet point, it does say that it cuts out, it reduces the automatic insulin delivery. So um, I do think that's a very good feature. And one of the biggest complaints I've heard about some of the other systems is that even though they put it on exercise mode, they still get low. And I, true. I tell my patients, I say, if you're not getting low, on the tandem control exercise mode. You're not exercising Ooh. enough. And so um, that's it. Now this, this basically, uh, and you can look at this later, but it just shows all the different features we've talked about that go into the algorithm. You know, the insulin on board, the sensitivity factor, the insulin to carb ratio. So these systems all take the same basic handful of settings. And I think us as providers need to go through some of these settings when patients come in, just like yours patient, that wasn't getting enough basil. So in conclusion, you know, these hybrid closed loop systems can reduce, and I would say almost eliminate lows, uh, which is time below range. They really improve time and range, which is really where it's at for most of us living with diabetes. It's impossible, It now it is possible to get your A1C down without hypos. In the olden days, you can get people below seven, but at the expense of tons of hypoglycemia. Um, and 
they're helpful, but not told, but not totally preventative when it comes to preventing your post meal high. If you eat a low uh, carb diet, you can almost go the whole day without bolusing on these systems. But yep. uh, you got to really minimize your carbs and spread them out. And they also greatly improve the fluctuations in glucose levels that we see 24 seven. And the, the indication we look at is the standard deviation and the percent coefficient of variation, which are on the Dexcom uh, and the Libre CGM devices. You can't use any other CGM except the Medtronic CGM with the Medtronic system. The Dexcom works with the looping, the Omnipod and the Tandem at the current time. I, get, I think my, my final comment is, if I go back five, let alone 10 years ago, and I look at where we are now, where, you know, in those days we were mostly looking at finger sticks and A1Cs. And now we've, of course, made it much more sophisticated with time and ranges. But I never, ever would have thought in our lifetime we would see what I see with patient after patient after patient coming in on automated insulin delivery. Pick your flavor, although the newer ones um, are clearly better, like anything, than the older ones. Yeah. Having said that, for people who are on top of it and they bolus and they're careful with their exercise, time below range under 2%, time above range, time in range of 80%, coefficients of variation below 30. I mean, there are still people, especially in Europe, who think the coefficient of variation target should be 36. And with this, we see it under 30, Earl, over and over. You and I, I'm, we're gonna lose our jobs. Fine. I'm gonna be Fine. a barista at Starbucks. You're older than me, we can both retire. That's a good idea. I'm ready. All right, thanks everybody, thanks Thank Earl. you, that was fun.